Okay, so we are live. Uh, good morning or good evening, ladies and gentlemen, depending on where you are in the world. And thank you for your interest in this panel dedicated to the current state of the U.S.-Russian relations. even worse and uh, as cliched as it may be i think it accurately describes the current state of affairs between our countries because until a few days ago the relations uh, were described as being at the worst historic level but then uh, joe biden gave an interview to abc calling uh, president putin a killer and i think it's fair to say that we have never been uh, at such a point before, at least uh, given how uh, this interview is being perceived in it, here in Moscow. I have uh, an amazing panel to discuss these and other issues with me today. And first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Oksana Boyka. I host uh, Worlds of Art Show on RT, a Russian government-funded uh, television network. But uh, people who are with me today are uh, of supreme uh, quality, if I may say, with direct access uh, to some of the decision makers on both sides and immense experience. So here they are, Konstantin Kosachev, a vice speaker of the Federation Council in Russia, James Collins, senior fellow of the Russian Eurasia program at Carnegie Endowment for International <laughs> Peace, Evgeny Buzhinsky, chairman of the executive board at Peer Center and formerly a high-ranking uh, official at the Minister of Defense. Uh, Peter Zwak, uh, former general or retired general rather, uh, who now works uh, at the Cannon Institute as Wilson uh, Center Global relations in the United States. Gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for uh, taking time to engage in this uh, hopefully interesting conversation. Let me first ask uh, you about your reactions to this latent Putin, latest uh, Putin killer controversy. Uh, is it a big deal? Is it uh, likely to change the already compromised dynamics uh, between our countries? Mr. Collins, why don't we start with you? Well, I think it's always unfortunate when we get into name calling. Uh, it does little for relations and it usually simply diverts us from the real issues that are in front of us. I, I frankly think uh, Mr. Biden's made pretty clear what his agenda is vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Russian Federation and in other areas. Uh, and I don't think, uh, despite uh, what will be a, a sort of uh, moment of uh, peak that this will change the relationship uh, because fundamentally great powers have interests and they have uh, questions that they must resolve together. So, I mean, it's a good news story. It's great headlines. But frankly, over, over the longer time, it is not going to make a major difference. But it doesn't help. Now, Mr. Kosachev, uh, Mr. Collins believes that uh, it's not a big deal, uh, but... Uh, Judging from the reactions in the Russian media uh, environment, I think people here are, are, are quite affronted. And I, I hear even moderate voices calling for uh, at least a temporary freeze in the relations uh, to simply you know, show the Americans that this is no other way to talk to us. Do you think that's a good idea or do you think that uh, Russians uh, indeed should be, uh, you know, more tolerant of uh, both uh, Mr. Biden's uh, circumstances, political circumstances and his uh, ideological agenda? Well, uh, first of all, I believe it was not a good idea uh, for Mr. Biden to answer that provocative uh, question the way he did. And uh, either it was a slip of tongue, probably, probably he did not hear well enough what he was asked about and just nicked and said, OK, this is what I support. Or it was a deliberate answer, well, uh, well planned, 
which is uh, even worse because it was a, an absolutely unnecessary and uh, untimely attack on Russia and personally on the president of Russia. Whether uh, one likes or dislikes Mr. Putin, it's a reality of our time that one has to communicate with Mr. Putin in case one uh, wants to, to contribute to international stability and uh, progress in international relations. And the way Mr. Biden decided, uh, deliberately, I believe, decided to handle this situation is absolutely irresponsible because uh, by that attitude, he just cuts off any further possibilities to have a real dialogue with Russia and personally with Mr. Putin. And this is a very bad news. Now, Mr. Sestanovich, I, I saw you nodding, um, and uh, I've been following you for quite some time, I'm sure you know. Uh, and uh, I noticed that during Trump's presidency, there were many occasions uh, during which you criticized Trump for not being presidential. Do you think calling uh, Putin a killer uh, at the current state of affairs was uh, a way of acting presidentially on the part of Mr. Biden? Well, I doubt the president expected this question. Uh, I, I think uh, the idea that this was uh, planned is surely incorrect. Uh, but I think it uh, was he was telling the truth in the sense that he was expressing his view and that of many uh, in the U.S. government. And I think it's worth unpacking a little bit to understand what he means. Uh, I think what he's saying is, he holds Putin ultimately responsible for many murders and attempted murders inside Russia and outside uh, the Russian Federation. As I say, many people uh, agree with this. The question of Putin's direct role, whether he gave orders for these events, uh, these actions, can be debated, of course. But there's no debate about whether Putin is... Uh, protects those who are directly involved, uh, whether through sham investigations or no investigations or dismissing the whole idea that anything terrible has happened the way uh, Russian leaders have said about uh, Navalny. And by the way, I might say I don't hear any criticism in the Russian parliament of the lack of investigations of these events. So I think what we're seeing is a is a reflection of the very low respect that President Putin enjoys in European countries and the United States. This is very unfortunate, but it's something that has to be recognized. Now, Mr. Brzezinski, uh, your colleague and counterpart just... Uh suggested that Mr. Putin has a very low respect uh, among his international counterparts. And I think if we are really serious, I mean, uh, if we are true to your profession, in strategic analysis, I think we would recognize that leading any state, any country requires making decisions about life and death. And uh, in the same regard, the Obama administration or the Biden administration will be directly or indirectly responsible for the deaths of uh, of people, uh, quite a number of people. I mean, uh, you can accuse any head of state of being a killer uh, just by the nature of, of his profession. But Mr. Brzezinski, uh, just uh, based on, uh, on the rules of diplomacy, do you think that's helpful? Because uh, I think you, you would recognize, as all our panelists perhaps would agree, that the relations are at a very poor moment right now, and they need to be improved, not just for the sake of the two countries, but uh, for the sake of humanity. on the same level as uh, Iraq under Saddam Hussein, Libya under Gaddafi, or uh, Yugoslavia, Serbia under Milosevic, and that's uh, unfortunate. After a uh, start was extended uh, among uh, a lot of Russian experts, there was a hope that uh, that would be the first step to some, some sort of improvement of our relations. 
And uh, we even uh, discussed with uh, our American colleagues uh, the uh, what what will be next. I mean, uh, next treaty, next agreement. Now I think that uh, the chances of uh, having something uh, next, at least in the foreseeable future, uh, are very uh, low. Why? Because uh, first of all, uh, taking into account the complexity of issues, non-strategic nuclear weapons, new kinds of uh, nuclear weapons, uh, it will uh, it, it 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 may take uh, years, at least uh, three, four, five years now. I'm absolutely sure that this year, maybe next year, there will be no uh, consultations, no, no, no negotiations on the uh, extension of START. Uh, moreover, uh, I think uh, that uh, we are now moving to the uh, open confrontation, which is fraught with uh, un- unpredictable uh, consequences. Now, Mr. Zwok, can I turn to you now? Because you also complimented uh, Mr. Biden for, quote, calm, thoughtful toughness that characterizes his approach to governance. Would you count his uh, recent characterization of Putin as an example of that thoughtful toughness? Uh, Thank you for the question. Uh, And uh, it's obviously complex. uh, Oksana, I, I, I think of your show, Worlds Apart, and we are there right now in this discussion, and I think in the greater dialogue between our countries. Um, I, do, uh, I do remind that uh, it was a question that, that I think surprised the president, um, and uh, I can't speak for him, but I can only imagine in the 22 years uh, that he has either been in the Foreign Relations Committee or eight years as vice president, uh, that he has been frustrated, uh, mostly in regards to the uh, Russian Federation and the, uh, and the Putin regime. Um, he was there for the failed reset. Um, um, he saw Georgia. He saw Ukraine. Uh, on his watch, uh, Nemtsov was assassinated. Um, and right now he's dealing with solar winds, reports of hacks, uh, uh, reports of hacks designed to weaken his candidacy with Trump. And, um, and, um, so, so he's got a lot, and Navalny, which is a a human rights issue in the bigger, uh, spectrum. So he's got a lot on his mind. Um, I, I do believe, um, his history is one where, uh, he's pragmatic. He knows that we must, as I think all of us on this board, we must find a way out of this two peak, um, uh, uh, out of this cul de sac. Um, as uh, General uh, Buzinski said, um, um, uh, if we, it, it gets too dang, it's already dangerous. When the words get hot, it gets more dangerous and clear headed thinking becomes visceral and nobody wants a conflict. But we have, we're, we're armed to the teeth uh, with uh, end of world uh, weapons that uh, if somehow with an accident or an instant goes, then all the talk, which I support, climate change and all that is irrelevant. So the presidents have got to find a way. I believe that uh, the president, uh, but the question was irritated and he just agreed. Um, but we are where we are. Well, uh, but gentlemen, I- I'm sorry, I'm going to play a woman's card. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned that I host a show uh, on RT and, uh, you know, I also have a baby and, you know, uh, millions of concerns which are obviously not comparable to the burden carried by the president. But I suppose that uh, a person in such position should be responsible for his actions and his words. So uh, the excuse uh, along the lines that he was, uh, I don't know, ambushed by this question with all his experience seems kind of uh, kind of weak to me but uh, that's just my thing mr collins i know that uh, you were last year you were among the sig- uh, more than 10 no not 10 100 signatories of an open letter calling for redefining uh us russia policy you also warned that uh, as things stand now uh it's very dangerous we have reached a dead end do you think we can uh, realistically find our way out of that dead end? 
uh, with statements like that, because uh, it's clear that uh, there are certain constraints on Mr. Biden's side, but uh, and Mr. Putin has more la- more space for maneuver. But uh, you know, he also has to deal with uh, certain Russian sensibilities, and very few people in Russia took that statement well. Mr. Collins, what do you think? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I don't disagree with anybody who's saying this is a problem. But let's face it, our communication has been pretty miserable for the last year or more. We have not had any serious dialogue between the two governments about almost any serious question. And so, yeah, this won't improve it much, uh, to say the least. But it isn't as though it's created a great new condition. We've had a problem from the, for years now of not seriously having any sustained uh, dialogue about almost anything substantive. Now, Biden came in with an agenda that I thought had three parts. And I don't think the administration is going to change that. And I think they will pursue it. The first is what I call hard security. This is an extended start. I think we're going to see uh, efforts to produce uh, dialogue on strategic stability and try to begin to address things like uh, cyber warfare and the issues that it, it resents. The second is essentially a what I would call a systemic uh, uh, adversarial situation. You know, we have different views about human rights. We have different views about how people govern themselves. Uh, we are involved in, uh, you know, sort of cultural warfare. Well, you know, this is a problem, uh, but it doesn't get better unless we talk about it. And one of the things that has troubled me for years is that when we talk about human rights, none of us is talking to each other about it. In the Soviet era, we did, and now we have not found a way to do that. And finally, uh, there are a lot of issues in which we frankly have joint interests, climate change, criminal activity across borders, refugee flows, uh, global issues of, of other kinds. I mean, I do not believe that in the longer term, that once we get over this in a, in a month or so, that the interests of uh, Russia and the interests of the United States are going to be simply set aside because two people don't like each other. Uh, it just isn't the way it works. And uh, at the same time, it's been true that two people liking each other isn't enough to produce very much in a way of a positive outcome. So we have that problem. And I think the re- reestablishment of some kind of dialogue is going to be the essential part. Uh, Mr. Kosachev, Mr. Collins just uh, framed it in terms of our personal relations between Putin and Biden, who have full right of disliking each other. But there are certain norms of... Uh, I think, diplomatic behavior and uh, also strategic behavior, because if we go back to the Cold War era, um, the two sides seem to be taking each other more seriously. They certainly watch their mouths far more carefully than than, uh, right now. Don't you think that this um, controversy with uh, calling Putin a killer it's not just uh, a slip of a tongue or unfortunate uh, coincidence, but actually a demonstration that all the rules of civil engagement have been uh, diluted. You know, the, the fact that uh, it is now okay to call another head of state uh, a killer, the fact that it's now considered to be fine, not a big deal, or at least, you know, let's put it on him being ambushed. Uh, don't you think that it perhaps forecloses the, the ability to restart any meaningful negotiation. Unfortunately, you are right. I do agree with you. This is a strategy. It's not a slip of tongue, but it's, it's a strategy. And uh, uh, for me, uh, the most alarming part of it is that, uh, as for now, America does not intend to have any dialogue with Russia. Uh, America is uh, takes it for sure that uh, it will have superiority, it will be stronger, it will have more allies, and uh, it will be able to contain Russia as a rival. Okay, so this is the strategy of containment. The legal instruments to conduct such a policy are 
quite limited by the international law. And in order to uh, break the walls and to getting out of this limited space of uh, instruments to contain uh, a rival, uh, one uh, needs to demonize that rival to put a country which one wants to contain outside the legal framework to declare that country as an evil breaking all, all possible rules and by that allowing for, for yourself to use illegal instruments against an illegal evil, so to say. And this is what happens uh, in our relations when the United States of America, since, let's say, the year of 2014 and probably even earlier, uh, continuously demonizes Russia, uses any unclear situation or case in order to blame Russia, in order to attack Russia, in order to uh, judge Russia and to declare Russia as an evil state. This is what happens now, but for me, the uh, real explanation for that, it's not about our uh, different views on democracy, on human rights. It's not about different values which we probably have or probably do not have. It's uh, a clear case of uh, unfair competition. Mm -hmm. And the United States of America does not recognize Russia as a real competitor, and the United States of America does not intend to have a real dialogue with Russia, even on issues which were mentioned right now by Ambassador Collins, and which are really uh, equally important for us and could have been uh, a uniting factor, but uh, probably will never serve that role in the future, unfortunately. Uh, Mr. Twop, can I uh, bring you into this conversation? Because I think the ironic part about this whole thing is that uh, a few days prior to this uh, faithful interview, a close ally of Putin, uh, our defense minister, Russia's defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, was very uh, complimentary, full of praise of uh, how promptly and constructively the Americans have moved on extending the New Star Treaty, how finally it was uh, easy to work with the new administration. And uh, I think we know uh, from our experience in Syria, on some other, uh, in some other areas, that military-to-military -military com communication tends to be uh, fairly good. Uh, is that uh, your impression as well? And should we perhaps uh, separate real life issues, important issues, and the rhetorical track? Um, again, thank you for the question. Um, it's a fundamental uh, question and issue. Uh, first of all, I, I think I'm probably not alone in this room here, um, that uh, I saw the quick signing um, of the New START extension as a really potential positive mooring anchor point to be able to pivot to new initiatives or at least uh, reinforcing what we have left. Um, um, but regrettably, all the hacking and all that came right on top of it and the dialogue has turned south. Um, I've written about it and I saw that you re read my article. Um, I thought that there might have been, because I do believe uh, uh, President Biden would be pragmatic. And, and um, doesn't want to be in a state of uh, perpetual confrontation. We have a fleeting opportunity to improve relations that rapidly is fading. And, I, and I'm sorry for that. On the military side, um, when uh, U.S. and Russian military, senior military, look each other eye to eye directly, um, it's, uh, it's usually a... It doesn't mean always agreement, but it's a positive thing. That is not happening enough in my mind. Yes, we have links between the DOD, um, sort of. Um, we have links in Syria. Um, uh, we have, um, uh, we have uh, uh, General Milley is talking to General Grasimov. But we are both nations that have worldwide interests in our geography. It's worldwide. And out in what we call our combatant commands, where the Russian military districts or OSKs are, there's almost no dialogue. 
between the operational commanders. And if there is a crisis in the future, it may happen near the Sea of Okotsk or in the Arctic that the local commanders need to resolve before it becomes a crisis in Moscow and Washington when it could therefore be too late. I was in Moscow from 12 to 14. It was difficult, a lot of disagreement, but a lot of understanding. And off that understanding, issues can be resolved. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Bozhinsky, if, if there's one silver lining in this whole controversy is that uh, many Russians have learned the new idiomatic expression, uh, walking and chewing gum at the same time. I mean, uh, I've never heard it used so much in the, uh, here in Russia. And uh, I think there is, a, I may be wrong, but it's my personal uh, perception that the Americans have sort of uh, come to assume that the cooperation, some sort of cooperation will always be there, that they can actually uh, treat us like shit, I'm sorry for my French, and still come to the negotiating table when it suits them. Do you think Russia should continue playing or walking along with that? Are there any issues of mutual importance where we can genuinely engage in meaningful, substantive dialogue or with the renewal of, uh, of, the, of the START Treaty, uh, pretty much that agenda is exhausted? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, I think that uh, uh, today, uh, just a few hours ago, President Putin gave uh, an answer uh, to your question. Uh, it's clear that uh, the uh, policy of the United States is to demonize Russia, but to cooperate Russia uh, uh, wherever and whenever it uh, fits uh, American interests. President Putin today said that uh, uh, Russia will cooperate uh, United States only uh, when this cooperation meets the interests of uh, Russia, not the United States. So I don't know how we will cooperate further. Uh, I want to um, actually add something to the what uh, General Zwak uh, has already said. It's about cooperation between the military. Now, the most difficult, I, I think the most urgent task, and back to your question, is to prevent, is to prevent um, real conflict between uh, our, uh, our nations, between our armed forces. Because uh, my strong belief is if a conflict between the United States, uh, I mean armed conflict between the uh, United States and uh, Russia happens, there is no way to control it. There, the the uh, escalation is imminent, and escalation, uh, well, uh, to the to the to the to the global catastrophe, and uh, the fact that we have uh, practically no communication between the military. There are only two uh, two actually uh, two examples. That's the communication between Gerasimov and uh, joint and uh, chairman of Joint Chiefs and uh, some uh, sort of uh, communication mechanism in uh, Syria to prevent uh, accidents. No more. And uh, taking into account the uh, very, very uh, tense situation in the, in, the, in the Baltic area, and especially now in the Black Sea area, any incident, any incident may lead to the, to the, uh, real, uh, to the real conflict. And I repeat, if a real conflict happens, uh, it will be it will be it will be catastrophic. Mm -hmm. And, I, and uh, to, to finish my my short uh, short short, uh, I I I like to ask my friend Peter Zwak not to use this phrase Putin regime. I don't call Biden regime. So please avoid it. You are you you used to be a diplomat. Thanks. Well. Um... Mr. Sistanovich, uh, Mr. Brzezinski was talking about this um, uh, possibility of, uh, of a conflict between our nations. And I think uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, there is a, a very divergent view of the probability of such conflict. In Russia, uh, it's still uh, considered as a, as a high probability. I can tell you that a few years back when... Uh, Things were hot, uh, pretty hot in Syria. I actually calculated how much time I would need to rush to my uh, kid's childcare so that I can die with him together. I mean, seriously, like I'm, I'm not joking here. I think at certain points the, the fear, at least the fear of of a major war in Russia, is is still pretty big. 
Uh, I don't think it's the, the same uh, on the American side. There, there are many here, many experts here in Russia who believe that the fear of a nuclear war uh, has decreased in the United States. They take deterrent, the nuclear deterrent, for granted. They don't believe that Russia uh, could ever resort to, to to be using those weapons. Don't you think there's something there that uh, perhaps the way we are behaving or conducting diplomacy towards each other is at least partially dependent on how differently we see a danger of uh, of a nuclear war, of a nuclear confrontation? Uh, Oksana, I'm sure that's right. And I feel sorry for anyone who has to uh, uh, live with the fear of imminent nuclear war. I don't feel your government or your media were treating you well if they made you feel that that was a large danger? Well, it wasn't my, my government or my, uh, the Russian media. I, I, I knew that there was uh, there were pretty tense no. standoff in the no. Mediterranean I, Sea re- regarding the Syrian war front. So I that made when me... When you have a leader who spends as much time as President Putin does bragging about nuclear weapons, uh, it's not healthy. But I think we're talking a little too much about a terrible, terrible result, uh, which is nevertheless a relatively low probability. Uh, We are talking, I think, too much about dialogue and communication and rhetoric, which it is the job of diplomats to manage. Uh, And I think our diplomats will manage this. Uh, I think the second and more important job of diplomats is to solve problems. And I don't think we paid enough dis- attention in this discussion to real problems that need to be solved. I think it was great that the New START Treaty was uh, is extended, but you know, if you're really thinking about what will produce a big change in Russian-American relations, I think you've got to talk about Ukraine. Uh, we're not, if we neglect a case where the UN General Assembly has has called what Russia did aggression, uh, then I think we are not serious about real problems. I thought that under President Trump, one of the advantages of this silly idea he had that he and Putin would be pals, but one possible advantage was that it would create an opportunity for Putin to wind down this awful adventure in Ukraine and call an end to the war in Donbass. But he didn't do it. And I think it one result of this has been a growing pessimism in Europe and the United States about whether uh, the Russian government is ever prepared to solve that problem. But, M- M- Mr. Sestanovich, you understand that when you pose a question that in order, like that, that in order to improve relations, Russia has to change without the Americans changing their own way, because I'm sure I you know all the uh, complaints that uh, our Russian panelists can bring to your attention. Oksana, you could, yeah? let, me, let me say what I'm really, I'll repeat what I said, which was not that Russia has to change, but that Russia has to end its war in eastern Ukraine and its occupation in eastern Ukraine. And on that, it's not me saying... And why is that? all European governments and the United States. It's no one thinks that what what Russia is doing in eastern Ukraine is legitimate or constructive. And that is a big, big problem. Your government is not prepared to address that problem. Well, but Mr. Sostanovich, your government is not prepared to address many other war problems, but rather than me... Um, arguing with you, Mr. Kosachev, why don't you jump in? I mean, what do you make of this argument that, you know, uh, Russia has to change its uh, foreign policy in order for Mr. Sestanovich, Mr. Biden and the likes to uh, start treating us uh, as a sovereign nation uh, with the diplomatic protocol that they afford to uh, other sovereign countries? I believe, unfortunately, that this is a very poor analysis. And if our relations are dependent on this type of analysis and uh, conclusions by uh, think tanks, uh, then the situation is even even worse uh, than it could have been. One, uh, without declaring 
any war. Uh, the United States of America uh, has been in a war just five times in its history, formally. Without uh, declaring any wars uh, right now, uh, every 12th minute an American bomb is uh, thrown somewhere in the world. Each 12th minute. In the last 20 years, uh, some 500,000 people have been killed during these military operations all about around the world with the uh, American involvement. If we uh, speak about Crimea, which Mr. Sestanovich, of course, will also call an occupation, I would like to recall that uh, the Crimea case did not contain a, a single victim, a single casualty. No military force was used in that case. And uh, if we speak about uh, right of people for self-determination, I cannot see any difference between two million Kosovars and two, two and a half millions of uh, people living in Crimea. The uh, eastern uh, Ukraine. I believe how happy our uh, Ukrainian neighbors would have been if they had a chance to prove any military presence of Russia in southeastern Ukraine. There is no evidence for that. Not because our military officers and soldiers uh, do not wear their uniform, but because they are not there. The situation in eastern Ukraine is a reaction of people living there. Thank you for smiling, Mr. Sestanovich. But believe me, believe me, in case, in case, in case, in case Ukrainian authorities could have learned out of our mistakes, which Russia did during the Chechen conflict, and I would like to recall how initially and wrongly Russia treated people of Chechnya in the early 90s, let's say, as criminals, terrorists, extremists, trying to force people in Chechnya to live together in an integrated Russian state by force. And this is exactly what Ukrainian authorities now try to do towards its own population in eastern Ukraine, calling all them as criminals and terrorists and using military force against its own and civil population. And this is a crime, not the military presence of Russia anywhere. And by the way, by the way, one more thing I would like to tell you about. Do you know that uh, the second largest military base of uh, United States of America in Europe is born still in Kosovo. The largest is Rammstein in Germany. The second largest is born still in Kosovo. Do you know when this military base was established? I will tell you, December 1999, some six months after bombing of Kosovo. At that moment, December 1999, there was no declaration of Kosovo independence and no recognition of that independence by any state. So Kosovo at that moment was an integral part of Serbia. And still the United States of America deployed its own military base in a part, in integrated part of former Yugoslavia in Kosovo. And this is what I call a military uh, occupation. Mr. Kosovo, let, 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 let me stop you right there because, I mean, we had to have uh, the, uh, this uh, exchange because it's inevitable in any discussion of Russian-U.S. policy. But I, I want to make it uh, less historical and more contemporary. And for that, uh, let me turn to uh, Ambassador Collins because... Uh, um, just a few uh, weeks ago, the Biden administration has published its uh, interim national security strategic guidance, which actually I think was received pretty well in uh, in Moscow, partially because it stated its intention to elevate diplomacy as the tool of first resort. Uh, it called for a substantive dialogue with Russia. I think the Russians were also encouraged by the uh, appointment of William Burns to uh, uh, the CIA, uh, they respect that person uh, a lot, and I know you, you you know him 
pretty well on a, on a personal level. My question to you is such, uh, how uh, the Russians and the Americans should talk to one another so they could listen. You, I think it was you who mentioned before that we tend to talk at one another rather than to each other. Given your experience, uh, given your aspirations for a more constructive state of affairs between our countries. What kind of tone uh, do you think both sides could agree upon so that we can move beyond those, these mutual grudges which we inevitably hear at any discussion on U.S.-Russian relations? Well, I mean, look, I was a diplomat, so I would simply say that you try to use diplomacy to the maximum extent you can to define where there are differences, how you can approach resolving them, and so forth. But I want to make one basic point. I, I think, you know, as I look back on our history and the way relations have developed over time, the current environment reminds me a lot of the, the kind of environment that one had in the late 60s or early 60s. We don't, we've lost the capacity to have a sort of framework within which we manage our relations. And uh, we're desperately groping around to try to force the other guy, each of us, to change the way we look at the world and so forth. Um, you know, I happen to believe that we're at a point where we and the European allies on our side and Russia and its friends on their side have to step back a little bit and begin to figure out what's a new Euro-Atlantic arrangement going to look like. And what are going to be the rules of the road that we can work out together to come to some better understanding of uh, how we work, uh, work together? We're not going to cease being adversaries and competitors. It's going to happen. But in the Cold War, as it developed, we managed to create a framework. We lack that framework now. It's chaos, basically. And I think uh, maybe it's time for people to begin to think again, first of all, in the United States and in Russia, what is an acceptable outcome from all of this back and forth and hostility? What kind of an arrangement would work to make it possible for us to live collectively and productively, even if adversarially, in this Euro-Atlantic world that we have to share? Mm -hmm. And right now, nobody's talking about this very successfully. And I don't think I see it from the Russian side. I certainly do not. And I think in the United States, we have a problem figuring out what we want as well. What would a good relationship with Russia look like? So I would simply say, you know, we've been, we need to begin to think about those as well as all of the tactical issues that we've been discussing today. I mean, you're going to have to have a solution to the Ukraine problem. I don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to have to involve Ukrainians, Russians, and, uh, you know, the U.S. and its allies. It's a simple fact. Now, we can argue about what it ought to be till the cows come home, as we say. But until we come to the idea that we're going to find a way to resolve it, I see very little to be optimistic about Mr. Brzezinski, Ambassador Collins just mentioned that the uh, transatlantic uh, relations and uh, Russia's relations with, uh, with NATO will have to be adversarial, but uh, it wasn't always this way. And in fact, in his recent statement, the Russian uh, uh, Minister of uh, Defense, Mr. Shoigu, even expressed hope for a full resumption of uh, the Russia-NATO Council, do you think that's just uh, empty rhetoric? Uh, the sort of the the, the semblance or uh, the desire to demonstrate uh, readiness to talk without actually being ready, or do you think the Russians indeed uh, are tired of having this uh, this not never ending uh, rivalry or rather skirmish with the with the United States? Uh, do you think the, the NATO relations are necessarily adversarial? Do you think they could be ever turned into uh, some constructive dialogue? I'm absolutely sure that uh, there may be some constructive dialogue, but first of all, we should uh, restart uh, the, well, uh, the work of uh, Russian NATO Council, because uh, it's, it's, uh, theoretically it's working, but uh, 
if if uh, the uh, only item, not the only, but the major item on uh, agenda is Ukraine, of course, uh, nothing will uh, improve. But first of all, we should uh, reestablish uh, the uh, 